And let's welcome the wonderful Alden Mills to the show. Hi, Alden. I think it's the other way around, Jane. You're the most wonderful. It's a terrific <laughs> opportunity to be here. And I love what you do. Oh, thank you so much. And it's great that you're over in Southern, Southern California in Tiburon. And I'm down here, down under in Sydney, Australia. And um, we can still connect. So the wonders of technology. And I'm very excited. I've been looking forward so much to interviewing you. And as you know, on Your Career Podcast, I always kick it off with this little question to make you think about your early career, because you've had one of the most fascinating, uh, fascinating career journeys that that um, I know of. So I'm really looking forward to hearing more. But tell me, what were your early career aspirations when you were a little boy, Alton? Well, my early aspiration was to join the band called Kiss. I wanted to be in the <laughs> black and white makeup and the dragon boots and who didn't want to spit blood and fire out of your microphone and everything. I thought that would just be the coolest thing. When I was <laughs> 10 and I had Gene Simmons and Ace Freed Lee, Peter Chris, Paul Stanley. And I just thought that's that's where I needed to be. Oh, fantastic. And, and I think being a member of a rock band, how good is that? And also having like the alter ego with all of the, the makeup oh, is so, is so oh exciting. Yeah, that was the key component here. Spikes <laughs> and, you know, big, long dragon nails on your boots and everything. I just thought they were the coolest thing ever <laughs> at the ripe old age of 10. And how did that go, Alden? It didn't go well. I I actually played the piano for a long period of time, but I really wanted to play the drums. And I told my parents that I knew how to play the piano already, and I could skip that because both my parents were really artists at heart. And they had convinced me that, oh, no, no, piano is the key to all instruments. And we love the idea that you want to play the drums, but you'll start with the piano. And I took a hammer to the piano keys and whacked them and said, see, I already know how to play. Now let me play the drums. And uh, 10 years later, I was still playing the piano. <laughs> you tried though. You tried. tried desperately. Okay. Tried. So, so taking a hammer to everything is not the right approach. Which no, should... it's definitely not. <laughs> So a lesson learned, which would have augured well for your future career. So how did things go with regard to your career? Because your background and your time with the Navy SEALs and how you made all these transitions, it they were big transitions. And so many right. people feel anxious when it comes to making a change. But you've managed to be so successful with each and every change, even though there have been ups and downs. So tell us the story, Alden. How did you you know, start your career? Well, before I tell you about my career and the career transitions, I really want everyone listening to know I had all kinds of anxiousness in every single one, but was able to find just enough courage to offset the anxiousness to go after each one. And I would really start my career with learning the sport of rowing and being able to sit on my butt and go backwards for long periods of time. I did that in high school, or I believe you have it as your secondary school down yeah. there. And that took me to the Naval Academy in Annapolis, Maryland, where I continued rowing and really looked for a way to continue to extend the passion and the purpose I found in rowing into what I knew I had to do for at least five years after I graduated the Naval Academy. And the closest that I could find that mirrored the wonderful teamwork and the grind of rowing and the water was SEAL Team. Mm. There's a, several other things that SEAL Team brings that rowing doesn't, but it became a stair step for me from rowing to SEAL team. And then after seven glorious years, three different platoons, I decided to transition to business school and really wanted to learn the business language and then start an entrepreneurial path. That was a very hard transition. 
And the reason it was so hard is I essentially grew up in the military. At the age of 18, I entered the US Naval Academy. And by 30, I had entered Carnegie Mellon Business School in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. And they, I didn't know anything about being a civilian, right? My entire vernacular was military. And that, <clears throat> and in SEAL team, they have a tradition where you have to stand in front of the entire team, which would be about 240 people, and explain to the team why you're leaving. Mm -hmm. And the best explanation I could give was I had this wanderlust of, wow, this was great. I had three wonderful platoons. I got to do all kinds of amazing things. But it was starting to get to a point where I was coming a little too routine for me. And I didn't want to be lackadaisical about anything you did in SEAL Team. And I was getting more and more interested about following my passions of these sketches that I would make when I was stuck on submarines for up to 50 days at a time. And so I, I really started dreaming more about bringing product to market and not just any product. It, it wasn't just um, any kind of a widget or a widget sake. I wanted to do a widget, hard good in particular, that help people better themselves some way, shape or form. Now, I'm giving you a bit of a circuitous route because I was 30 when I went to business school, didn't really have a business plan by the time I left went and worked for a tech startup, moved to San Francisco. I was born and raised in Massachusetts. So went from the East Coast to the West Coast of the United States. That was a big move in itself. Moved to a city that my wife and I knew no one, neither of us had lived there. And then spent the next two years discovering that I really did not like the technology. The, the bits and the bytes and the code, I, I couldn't relate with it and decided that I was going to get involved in fitness, which fitness had been a big part of my life growing up. And I loved the idea of this mantra of take control of your body, take control of your life. So I went on a quest to create a product that could help others. The first two businesses I created were fantastic failures. The third business became an Inc. 500 fastest growing company. We were number four in the country, fastest growing consumer products company in the country and invented a series of fitness products that ended up selling millions. Um, and one of them was the perfect push-up, yes? Correct. Yeah, I was having a look at the perfect push-up. It looks very interesting. Yep. We did the perfect push up, perfect pull up, perfect sit up, perfect ab carver, about a hundred perfect products in general. And I did that business from 2006 until 2015. And at which point I was feeling a little bit like I was in SEAL team. Perhaps it was burnout, perhaps it was, this is getting too routine for me and decided we wanted a new challenge at this point, my family had multiplied to four boys. And at the time there were three, five, seven, and nine. And we packed up everything we owned, rented our house, sold our cars, sold the furniture and moved to Spain for a couple of years. And in that process, I decided that would be my next big career transition. I would write my second book. I'd already written the first back in 2013. And I would focus all my efforts on getting on the speaking circuit. Instead of just helping people with their biceps, I was going to help them with the muscle between their ears. Now, may I stop you there just for a minute? So you wrote your first book. Was this one Be Unstoppable? Correct. It yeah. was Tell me about Be Unstoppable. Be Unstoppable hatched in 2002 when a dear friend of mine was the first Navy SEAL to die in Afghanistan. And when you go off on SEAL missions, they make you write a just-in-case letter. If you are to give the ultimate sacrifice, die for your country, they want to make sure there's more than a flag to give to your next of kin. 
So they want a handwritten letter. I wrote three of those letters, but those letters were my next of kin back then was my mom, my dad, and my brother. I know that Neil's next of kin was an 18 month old son. Mm. And I, at the time, Jennifer was pregnant with, with who would be our first son of four. And I didn't know if I was going to have a boy or a girl, but I was like, you know, I'm going to write a letter to my unborn child. And it wasn't a very good letter. It was do this and don't do that kind of thing. And then 2003, Henry was born. I kind of put the letter aside, but I kept thinking about it. 2005, Charlie was born. I wrote him another letter. 2007, John was born. Got a little bit better. By 2009, I was like, you know, I, I'm going to make this letter a lot better and I'm going to make it into a small book. But I really stumbled on it and decided the only time I'd write this because I was traveling so much would be on airplanes. And I ended up creating a parable about a seaside town called Up To You, where everybody's born with their own boat. And it's a story of two sea captains, young sea captains, just graduating Up To You University. And one of them decides that they want to leave the harbor of familiarity and go across the horizon to new destinations but he doesn't know how to do it and he ends up meeting what i call a master and commander and the master and commander is a captain of a vessel that goes across the horizon and teaches the young sea captain the eight essential actions of the master and commander code that's the story behind Be Unstoppable. And it came out in 2013. I thought I'd publish 100 copies. Um, we sold probably 30,000, 40,000 copies, and it's published in several languages. Oh, beautiful. Um, what a wonderful start. And there's so much meaning and your own personal experience in that book as well. So I'm going to have to read that. I haven't read it yet. I've just oh. read it. now that I know the story behind it, it's going to be even more meaningful. So that's the first thing I'm going to do when we finish this podcast. Yeah, please do. Yeah. I'd love to hear your feedback. Oh yeah. Oh, definitely. Full variance by now. Yeah. Uh... Now so so you wrote Unstop Be Unstoppable. And it's obviously a, a, a very meaningful book with lots of life lessons that you've learned in it as well. And so let's go back. You moved to Spain and you decided that you wanted to do more. So I'm thinking your career anchor is probably challenge. <laughs> okay, yeah. You're always up for a challenge. And, and once things get a bit routine, it's like, OK, even though you might still get the adrenaline rush if you're in the armed forces or whatever that you're doing, but you need to have the next thing problem to solve and so now you want to solve other people's leadership problems and you so you set up your coaching and training business is that right i i did and i i really you know i every one of these career changes have been from a selfish point of view and the selfish point of view was what gave me the most joy there was a time in seal team where didn't feel like I had worked a single day. And many of us would say the moment it started to feel like work, we were going to leave. And for me, that was at around seven years. And I look back at my career journey and it's usually around seven year increments that I go through the journeyman process of, oh, this is a struggle. This is interesting. How do I master this? How do I do that? And then you get to a certain level of mastery and for me, most of the time I find like, okay, if I'm in the 90% range, like that's good enough. I'm getting bored. I want to try something else. The greatest fulfillment I have received besides successful missions out of SEAL team or letters from people saying, hey, the, your product, it saved my life. It, it did this or it did that or somebody saying that your book helped me change the direction, those, those are the real fulfilling feedback points. And as I have progressed through my career, I've really found the joy 
and giving and first owning on my gift. I'm terrible at most things. I mean, absolutely awful. And it, you know, it takes a while to really come to grips with what you suck at versus what you <laughs> might be this one thing that you know in your heart of hearts, like, you know what? Good at that. I could be really good at that if I kept practicing it. Let's call that the gift or the superpower. And then you learn how to give it away. And you learn how to give it away to other people without expectation of return. And I find there's a lot of great living that comes from that experience. Hmm. You know what this makes me think? Perhaps pure challenge is one anchor that is very high on the list, but the next one, or maybe even the first one, is dedication to a cause or service, making an actual difference in what you do. That could be the driver. It's like, I need to do more. I need to help more. That's really fascinating. And so now as you, so you, you, you grew your corporate training, leadership training, self-leadership training business, and you speak for a living. And, and I've watched some of your amazing YouTube videos of, of the way that you talk and the energy that comes through when you're on the stage and you're telling your story. You're a master storyteller, Alden. Yes. And oh, I, love, um, I love putting people in the moment. Yeah, yeah, that's right. And we all love stories because as soon as you start with once upon a time or let me tell you a story, people really? start to lean in. It's a lean in experience, isn't it? That's and that's, that's what I've noticed when I was watching your YouTube videos of your talks. And I would recommend that everyone hop onto Alden's YouTube um, channel and subscribe and watch them because you you take us on a journey when we're listening to your stories and it gives us all that little spark of inspiration like hey i can do this too yes and get rid of that self-limiting belief which almost every leader has <laughs> no matter how yeah. good you are you've always got that self-limiting belief haven't you okay so tell me a little bit more about your business now alden so who who do you provide talks to? Where do you go? What have you done? Tell me some background stories. I'm sure there's some fun stuff in there that you can share. Well, 2015, I actually started getting on the speaking circuit from Spain and would fly back to the United States to give a speech. And that went terrifically well until March 16th, 2020. And I had at that point, uh, my career for speaking was just moving up and to the right. And then on March 16, 2020, my entire year was canceled. That was COVID. Mm -hmm. And I had to reinvent myself. I mean, there was no in-person speaking whatsoever. And I was really thinking, oh, I hadn't seen this coming. You know, you didn't, you'd think this is a pretty recession proof business. And I would often tell this story of the one piece of advice my father would give me right before he dropped me off at SEAL training. And he had been an Air Force officer. And long story short, was he had no military advice whatsoever to give me. He couldn't even relate with doing the SEAL thing. But he did say, Alden, if you ever get stuck, just give and give the best that you have of yourself and give with all you have and give without expectation. And some mighty forces will come to work for you. And I've used that term, you get stuck, give many times. And I ended up literally hearing his voice when I was stuck speaking and I just gave to one of my favorite local charities in San Francisco and created uh, an online speech that was based off of one particular submarine mission where I had to be in a submarine for 50 days. This was the beginning of COVID. Created a little acronym called Remote, the six actions to thriving in a quarantine. And I did it for the charity group. We raised about $30,000. And then everybody saw that speech and they're like, Alden, you've got to come to our company virtually and do that. A year and a half later, Entrepreneur Magazine rated me as the number one virtual speaker in the United States. But that all started 
not because I was trying to be some something other than I was just trying to be helpful and give what I could give at a time where people really needed something. And that then morphed into coaching where executives would ask if, hey, will you be my swim buddy? You talk about this Navy SEAL swim buddy. And today I'd say a large majority of my business is between the speaking and the executive coaching where I work with CEOs and C-suite executives. Mm. No, it's what an amazing story. You know, when COVID hit March 2020, the world just turned upside down, didn't it? And yeah. and and I I I 100% relate to to how you felt because you know as, as a coach, you know a lot of it is in person and conducting training and standing up in front of a room and delivering workshops and things. And we all had to reinvent ourselves, didn't we? And get on top of technology and then start to deliver webinars and virtual talks and everything. And I think being able to leverage technology and being willing to adapt and change to inevitable forces of change that will happen. Who could have predicted a global pandemic that would last so long um, and drive, you know, absolutely everybody, everybody mad and cause so many problems. But I think during the COVID times, people were really looking for uh, inspiration and help and support. And so that talk must have given so many people hope as well and would have augured so well for your business just inadvertently and and it's funny how things happen isn't it how sometimes it's serendipity sometimes it's uh true adversity um that enables us to be the best that we can be and so what would you say alden is your favorite talk that you love to deliver well first of all i never give the same talk twice And every single speech I give is custom tailored to the audience. And I love doing that for two things. Number one, it terrifies me when I walk out on stage. (laughs) It gives me an adrenaline rush because I'm like, hmm, I don't know how this is going to go. And that fear fuels me to stay on my toes and to deliver the best that I can. Number two or making it customized like that, is it gets me very curious about the client and the audience and what's keeping them up at night. Now, if you were to ask me if there was one thing, you know, my second book is Unstoppable Teams, it would be an intersection of my third book that I've just delivered, doesn't come out for a year, called Unstoppable Mindset and Unstoppable Teams. And over the years of working with all kinds of different leaders, I've really established this three level of leadership focus that starts with leading yourself, expands to leading teams, and then expands even further to leading the culture of your organization. But the most critical leadership role is always you leading yourself first. So that's where I'd zero in on. And then if I could expand a little, sometimes they want me to put mindset and teams together. Mm -hmm. It kind of comes full circle, doesn't it? Because self-leadership is essential in order for you to be able to get anything done effectively uh, before you can even be uh, an effective leader. And then when you think about the discipline back when you first started your career uh, and being, you know, a a competitive rower and and you're on this incredible team and, you know, it's just you're such a good rower and then joining the Navy SEALs where it's very disciplined and you really have to be the best and on top of your game in order to do that. And I think the training from the sport and then the training from being in the armed forces really gives you that that discipline, doesn't it? And a a really good mindset uh, to do the right thing and to get the job done. And then when you build your own business, if you don't have self-discipline and self-leadership, you can't possibly build your own business can you and and so with all of these insights from your personal experience now you bring it into the corporate world that makes such a valuable offering that you have for any business you know if someone wanted to find you alden where where's the best place to find you it would be on my website Mm -hmm. alden dash mills.com um and that's 
that is a quintessential place where you can get from, you can see the videos. I post all the time, free blog information, um, alden-mills.com. Okay. I will have that in my show notes on your career podcast. So people can just Ooh. click through and also we'll be able to find Alden on LinkedIn and on Instagram too, but go first to alden-mills.com and have a look at some of those amazing videos because they certainly inspired me. And it was such a, such a pleasure talking to you, Alden. I could talk to you all day. Before I let you go though, if you were going to give us the top three tips or self-leadership, because that's foundational, what would they be? I'd like everybody know that there are very few things we can control, but those few things that we can control can totally change our destiny. The three things that I want you to be aware of are what thoughts you attach to, where you put your focus, and constantly evaluating your beliefs between empowering ones and limiting ones. All three of these thoughts, focus, beliefs, they work in a loop. They build off of each other. Doesn't matter where you enter into that performance mindset loop, but pay very close attention to those thoughts. Are they helpful or hurtful to what you're trying to do? Where are you putting your focus and I think of focus like a funnel that funnels energy into you taking an action. And then you decide if you can find a reason to believe and keeping taking that action. Because at the end of the day, whatever career transition you decide to do, you're going to need stamina to persist. Because anything new and new to you, you're not going to be great at it first. As a matter of fact, you're going to be terrible at it. But if you can keep finding the stamina and the encouragement and the positivity to get up day after day and give it all you've got, and then a little bit more, doesn't matter what career transition you go to, you will be successful. Mm -hmm. So much of it is your mindset, isn't it? And you yeah. need to have be in the right mindset to get anything done. Well, I could talk to you all day, Alden. That's been I feel very the same inspiring. Way, Jane. <laughs> well, there we go. I, I think we both love love storytelling as well. And and if it helps and resonates. You just scratch the surface of the yeah. storytelling. Oh, go. I know. Well, there. we'll have to we'll have to have you back. And I'm I'm going to try and get the best stories out of you next time. But thank you so much, Alden, uh, for joining us on your career podcast. It's been an absolute pleasure, and I look forward to having you back again in a few months time if you would like sounds great jane i'd like that okay thank you so much and bye now bye